Okay. Um, I think that we are starting the session with a report ba reports back from uh, the breakout rooms. Um, and I think the first moderator uh, with the report is Adam. Adam, let me know if you need me to show some of the notes that I took or what are you? Yeah. Let me do this. Uh, let's see how good my memory is. And if I miss anything, please chime in or, or bring them up sure. uh, to make sure that okay. I capture it. Um, you know, so we, we had a, an awesome discussion. You know, thank you so much for all the discussions and, and the input. Um, and let me start by just going through uh, a set of uh, essentially strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, but then also try to connect them across that. Some of the strengths really, you know, reverberated what you saw in the, in, in presentations in the past, and and uh, we had a chance to review, which is really that the Anvil is a premier example of the use of the cloud on behalf of researchers in ways that allows them uh, to scale activity, accelerate uh, the discovery process, recognition that as Anvil grows, the discovery landscape is going to uh, really expand for those consortia that participate in the use of Anvil because they'll be able to interconnect across their own data with data in the Anvil. In that strength is also uh, challenges, uh, really positioned on the weaknesses, which are that in order to interoperate, um, you know, while the genomics uh, front, you know, I think has made tremendous headway, people pointed to really the phenotypic and data model landscape as still being, you know, widely diverse in ways that pre-built um, interoperability for search or um, cross data analytics is still going to be a challenge, but a place where the advent of the cloud will continue to push uh, innovation in that setting. Other strengths are that the availability of those cloud-based resources really democratize access um, uh, you know, to all types of consortia, uh, independent of their locale or local resources or differences in the DCCs themselves and the capacity to support analytics. Um, and that within that setting, it also provides a robust training opportunities for those consortia and the networks that, you know, the PIs and their students as they tackle domain specific and stakeholder uh, specific interests have a ready made environment for training in ways that uh, trainees can carry forward and expand uh, independently. That landscape of intersection with consortia also brought up, uh, you know, really I thought a use case that I had not, you know, fully thought about, which is, that whether we're willing to always say out loud or not, and I appreciate Alex's so transparency, you know, science is a competitive landscape. It's competitive on behalf of the discovery landscape, but it's also competitive on behalf of the resources that the NIH is uh, provisioning on behalf of building out the data ecosystem. Competition on behalf of discovery, uh, I think the discussions really pointed to, you know, the strengths of the animal really that, um, you know, being promoting competitive practices around who can better use the cloud in some respects aligns with the NIH's mission to accelerate discovery because those who can compete to essentially analyze data faster, better, uh, more broadly, essentially advance discovery, you know, more broadly in ways that could potentially be non-local lead constrained. However, the emergence of the Anvil and many other platforms also raises the risk that the diversity of DCC-based resources, um, you know, might be a jeopardy, uh, meaning that, you know, there's how many DCCs are going to use just the Anvil? Is the Anvil really the DCC or some of the questions? Mitigating those risks are really uh, opportunities that have emerged under the NCPI efforts where, um, you know, the Anvil is heavily positioned as an interoperable landscape uh, of use where essentially interoperability with the Anvil, with other emerging platforms or data resources, cloud or otherwise potentially, um, still maintains the potential for diversity in the data ecosystem landscape on behalf of DCCs. And the reality is that the data landscape is still too complex in order to simply rely on technology to support advancing the data stewardship needs of consortia and that you ultimately still need DCCs to steward this, but that relationship potentially is beginning to be redefined and optimized. A key challenge and, and, and threat that is not unique to, to the Anvil that we spend some time talking about is cost. Uh, cost is a you know, recurring narrative, again, not unique to, to the Anvil. Uh, cost as a DCC, cost as investigators want to use 
um, the anvil, transparency around those cost bases, and related to cost are really the challenges of sustainability. So even um, as it relates to the engagement of the cloud use um, itself, even if you onboard the cloud, you have to make decisions as a DCC or as a user as to the sustainability of those costs in ways that will not require you to then shift or lose the gains uh, positioned in the cloud. And that really um, the primary way to mitigate that threat uh, is through really NIH engagement uh, and developing models uh, for uh, the use of the cloud in ways that um, really advances and presses on the value of the cloud and the Anvil provide against the locally uh, pro provisioned, um, typically uh, subsidized use of um, HPCs within institutions. Together, I think these frame you know, a, a common set of, of narratives that bridge across the Anvil specific landscape uh, in which you know, the, the Hopkins and, and, and Broad team have done an amazing job of really prioritizing um, the strengths and opportunities, but recognizing that these are still early on and they'll be exponentially driven as more data comes in, as standards begin to be further established across those large scale data sets to drive the need to implement them elsewhere. While at the same time, in an Anvil non-specific way, there are challenges around the use of the cloud as it relates to the current landscape. And lastly, I'll end with you know, really one of the cross-cutting themes that I think is a really innovat innovative space for the ends of Anvil Beyond tools and interoperability. And that is, um, you know, how can these types of resources like the Anvil impinge on the trans translational impact um, for today's patients? You know, how can the clinical process itself be advanced through these resources? If the premise is that NIH research drives um, new discovery on behalf of health, can we bring that into the clinical domain in a much more proximal setting? And what are the challenges around that? Here, um, some challenges, but one that can be converted to opportunity are one, a mechanism that essentially drive trust between healthcare ecosystems and the ANVIL um, in ways that are transparent and uh, engage the clinical use on behalf of value in part to patient. Historically, hospital systems and clinical enterprises eventually um, if there's benefit to patients, we'll find ways uh, to leverage those resources on behalf of those patients, because in many ways, they themselves are competing on behalf of both the disease landscape itself and the care of patients. And that's a narrative that will continue uh, to evolve. But those are, are still going to be challenged by current uh, modern ecosystems that, again, bring to bear models, uh, data uh, structures, and the healthcare ecosystems overall challenges as relates to their own infrastructure around genomic clinical data, imaging data, where they, their coordination of those factors are challenging on their own within that institution. And this is where the Anvil has already made some, some strides by at least developing tools that are clinically useful uh, for the clinical environment and making those available uh, to the community for standardized use implementation. Valentina, that's my stream of consciousness memory uh, of the discuss discussion. Let me know if I missed anything uh, critical. I, I think you touched all the key points. Um, thank you, thank you, Adam. This was excellent. Um, Perfect. Should we move to Marin? Sure. All right. I am going to share my screen so that I can share the slides with you. Hopefully you can see those. All right. Ken, thank you so much for making the slides while the rest of us spoke. Um, so we had a great discussion um, in our group, and I think you'll notice that some of the themes that Adam just talked about from the other breakout group came through also in the context of tools. So first, for strengths, where does Anvil excel? Um, it, we heard from several in the group that the documentation and the tools available in the workflow setup is done very well. Uh, many in our group said that they have members of their team that have been able to get on there and learn pretty quickly within a matter of days how to use the tools in the, in the system, whereas just going to a different cloud-based system on your own can take weeks. Um, the data access and the accessibility that's there now uh, is is easy to use and, and folks are happy with that, it's a strength. 
Um, I would say currently, I would like to intercede here. We discussed lack of fairness, which is machine, uh, you know, uh, programmatic access is not in place. This is a user interface based access only. Right? No fairness. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, the variant interpretation tools and workflows and the ease to develop new tools in the workspace was seen as a strength. Uh, the plans that the Anvil team has in place to allow third party groups to build on the platform is also seen as a strength. And the way that they have put security first in regards to third party tools and workflow plans um, was seen as a strength. It was mentioned that you know, there's a lot of concern in the cloud and the way that they have things set up makes it much easier for folks to bring their tools and get things set up and just go into a native cloud system. Um, while they've done a great job, we identified a number of weaknesses. Uh, one is developing tools for analysis on open access data sets. So there are some data sets not there and uh, having the tools to use those would be, uh, would make things better. Um, there's a lack of tools for single cell analysis. Uh, specifically, while a lot of the documentation is great, there needs to be improvements specifically related to DocStore. Um, it was noted that there are a lot of tools, and so it's hard to find tools and workflows that have already been developed. And so coming up with an improved strategy to both curate and search through the tools and workflows that are already there would be useful. Uh, tools for interpretation of SNPs and better annotations, as well as uh, tools for mediation analysis and Mendelian randomization. I think co-localization analysis was also mentioned. Um, those are currently not there, and that was perceived as a weakness. Um, tools that allow for analysis of clinical data that's built using clinical data models such as OMOP, and thinking about things like FKB algorithms. So these are the rule-based algorithms for electronic health records. If the data tables were put there for OMOP-based OMOP or modeled clinical data, being able to deploy the algorithms would be, um, would be great. And currently, there's no capability for anything like that, um, as well as SAM tools that was also mentioned. Um, a mechanism to anonymously log in is, is not there. And improved mechanisms for feedback was seen as a weakness. Um, on to opportunities. Where can Anvil grow and improve? Um, adding additional data standards and data models so that uh, we can improve the interoperability model for Terra um, is, is an opportunity. Improving the availability, availability to search all available records for matches to an individual patient. So as we look to the future of Anvil and more clinical data are there, being able to um, take an individual kind of set of characteristics about a patient or a machine learning model and matching them with other patients in the Anvil would be a great opportunity. Um, being able to link necessary tools to expand and diversify the Anvil user community is also another opportunity. And this is something where we think this will come up again in the afternoon session around outreach and training. But as the Anvil works to bring the, the tool and, and the capability out to a broader user base, so these are you know, not our typical users of something like the Anvil, we will learn a lot about what tools we don't yet have that would be useful to that, that broader user community. Um, creating a safe space for groups that are hesitant to host their diverse data sets in public repositories. Um, data sets were mentioned like the MVP. Um, some countries would be uncomfortable hosting their data. There are some other kind of protected groups that if there were a way to have the data kind of you know, in this system, but safe such that individuals can't access the individual level records, but still be able to run analyses in aggregate across the data sets. Um, that's an opportunity. Having tools that accommodate the admixture and diversity of human genetics data sets, as well as uh, the new reference genomes that are gonna be available and making sure that they're backward compatible with the older reference genomes is another opportunity. As we see the uh, diversity of human genetic data sets um, increase in the future, having tools available to um, accommodate those would be important. Tools, tool-based use cases to encourage Anvil being accessible to non-cloud experienced groups. So especially, uh, again, this will probably come up in the outreach session, but as um, researchers from institutions that don't have cloud experience and perhaps don't have capability to even host these large data sets, 
this is a huge benefit of having Anvil, but then having use cases and tool-based use cases for those individuals to learn is going to be important. Um, expanding the tools that are tailored to the clinical genomics community for clinical decision support, um, as well as tools to facilitate going from CRAMs to variants to the interpretations would be uh, seen as an opportunity. And then tools to support training on the ANVIL for both basic science researchers as well as clinical genomics researchers. Um, I think the user base is likely to expand in the future and having the tools there to support the training um, would be important. And then finally, the threats, what jeopardizes uh, the future of Anvil, cloud costs, which we heard from Adam. Um, this is something that, that we're gonna need to, to be able to deal with. Um, difficulty in facilitating the culture shift to the cloud. It's, it's a new world, this is the future, but getting people on board is, is a threat. Um, there are challenges in making the tools and resources um, in a manner that meet users where they are. You know, there are sophisticated users, and I think they're going to be able to jump onto the platform and use it. And then there are going to be users who need tools to make what's there accessible to them. Um, and that, that's going to be challenging for the team um, because the team is sophisticated in their, in their capability. Um, difficulty in making Anvil interoperable with other platforms. Um, one that came up is the research analysis platform for UK Biobank, which is built in another cloud system. So as more people get comfortable with that system, the tools there are different from the tools being developed in Anvil. The actual kind of algorithms and methods might be the same, but how they look and how they are deployed is different. Um, hurdles required to access Anvil um, just to test the platform. So if there is a big learning curve, you know, are there ways to make it easier even to just know that it's a good use of time to use the platform? And then finally, as we do think more about clinical data and um, clinical genomics reports and doing those annotations and interpretations in Anvil, um, thinking about liability and, and how to deal with that is the final threat. Um, so I think that was everything that we came up with. Ken, uh, feel free to chime in if I've missed anything from our group. No, you, this is, you did an excellent job. Thank you. Sure, thank you. I think we have even two minutes left uh, on the session. If anybody has any question for Marilyn and Adam, Titus. Um, I'm going to do that. This is more of a comment than a question thing, but I, I and I put it in the chat. It's just, you know, everybody wants Anvil to do everything, and that's not possible. So to me, the existential threat for for Anvil is um, how do you decide which things not to do, uh, and how do you uh, um, there's a word, communicate that within the landscape where everybody wants you to do everything. And I just want to acknowledge that that I think this is something Valentina and, and Ken have been struggling with. And I, I just really want to bring that right out there and put it right up front as if you can pull off this hat trick, this this tight, yeah. tight rope walking trick, uh, it'll be awesome. Uh, it, and Anvil is already serving a lot of amazing needs. Um, so I think it becomes more a question of communication and strategizing than, than anything else, so. Well, this is a very good point. Yeah, and something that we you how at Valentine are always constantly trying to figure out the best ways to mitigate. <laughs> Anshul, you have your hand raised. Yes, yeah, so I just want to follow up on Douglas's comment. I think um, <clears throat> one way to potentially do it is to actually empower additional external users to come in and really make Anvil their home. And that might, you know, so, so shifting the responsibility primarily from the Anvil team to to others in the external community, like having a much wider base of developers, I think is an effective strategy. And maybe that's yeah. the line to draw as to what what is core Anvil responsibility and what is like could be offloaded to close collaborators. Let me just make one last comment on on, on uh, both the comments that came up, and one of the things that I think at least for me is exciting is that. You know, we still are living in sort of the lands of metaphors that relates to the cloud, meaning that um, it, you know, there's a, an instinct to try to relate what is happening in the Anvil to what happened before, uh, where in reality, we're defi defining new ways of doing research that did not exist before. Mm -hmm. um, and we haven't yet fully transitioned into really, I think at least my, sen my sense is as a scientific community, to what is really possible in the context of a decentralized cloud environment that supports rapid scalable compute 
access search. Um, you know, so, so there, I guess my, my caution here that um, I don't think we have to define everything that the Anvil needs to be because some of it will actually, there's a risk of, of creating boundaries around what's possible and some of it will emerge um, as long as we can get people to use it in the first place uh, in that setting in, I think, new and hopefully wonderful ways. That's the positive spin on Titus's cautionary tale. Marilyn, you want to add anything to it? No, I agree with that. I, I think that was the great yin to his yang or yang. To his yin. <laughs> okay. Um, it's 2.16 according to my clock. So um, why don't we adjourn? Uh, we have a 15 minute break. We're going to be back at 2.30 and that's when we're going to start uh, the second session with the two other two breakout rooms. So enjoy your break.